The first thing I should do here, I think, is apologize because I'm about to spend the next few minutes telling you about my granny through this visual medium, and I'm not even going to show you a photo of her. I have photos of her, but not many, and not any that I can let you see. Granny didn't like to have her picture taken. Whenever you tried, she'd put her hands up in front of her face like a vampire confronted with a crucifix and say, Don't take my picture! When I was growing up, she had one of those Kodak Tele-Instamatic cameras, the flat rectangular ones with the built-in flash, and she would take lots of pictures of all of us during Thanksgiving or Christmas morning or birthday parties. That way, there were plenty of pictures to remember the special times, and Granny didn't have to actually be in any of the pictures, but you'd still think of her when you looked at them because you'd know she took them. That's pretty ingenious. I didn't put that together until a few days ago when I was thinking about her. Okay, I fibbed a little. There is one photograph of Granny I can show you. It's this one here. <laughs> That's Granny. And that chubby-cheeked cherub she's hiding her face behind is me. This was taken a few years ago. Actually, Granny is 48 years old in that picture. Her hair turned white very young, when she was still in her 30s, as a matter of fact. I've always assumed that was my father's fault. He was a handful. The fact that she had white hair for the entire time I knew her gave her an ageless quality. She didn't seem to grow older as the years passed. She didn't change. She was the constant in my life. When I started kindergarten, Granny was there. When I graduated high school, Granny was there. When I got together with my first serious girlfriend, Granny was there. When I moved out of my parents' house, when I started dating Ashley, when Ashley and I got married, when my parents divorced, Granny was there. Granny died on January 9th, so she won't be there anymore. That's the truth. That's the reality but it still doesn't seem quite real. Then again, that doesn't surprise me because Pap died 15 years ago and that still doesn't seem real either. There are absences that you just never get used to, I guess. People who take up so much space in your life and in your heart that there's always a part of you that's waiting for them to come back, no matter how long they've been gone. Granny lived for 86 years. She spent 65 of those years in a two-bedroom home in a suburb of Hagerstown, the house she shared with her husband, my pap, until he died in 2004. On January 9th, my father, my brother, and I were with her when she died in that house. She'd been sick, cancer, she'd been declining for a while, but had been relatively okay until a little over a week before she died. During the last lucid conversation I had with her, the same day my father had called in hospice to assist with her care, Granny told me with some disbelief how quickly she'd begun to feel this way, how she'd felt fine just the day before. Now she didn't even have the strength to stand on her own. She spent the last two days of her life mostly unconscious, on morphine, seemingly comfortable, taking her breath in gasps that came only six or seven times a minute. My brother and I were sitting on one of the couches in the living room where Granny lay in a hospital bed hospice had brought in two days before. Our father sat nearby in the recliner where my pap used to sit. We were talking about cars, my brother is a mechanic, and about some land my brother's thinking about buying. When we noticed it had been longer than usual since we heard Granny take a breath. We stopped. We waited and the next breath never came. That was at about 10 minutes before 5 p.m. when we noticed she had stopped breathing. Dad called hospice and very shortly a nurse arrived to examine Granny and make the official death pronouncement. Her time of death was recorded as 5.27 p.m. I realized that was something unique about being with someone when they die. You know their actual time of death. Before that, it never occurred to me that a person's actual time of death and their official time of death could be different. Granny is the first person I've ever been with when they died. I wasn't with my pap when he died. I saw him on his last day, but like Granny, he was unconscious 
and I left before his time came. That didn't bother me so much. I had spoken with him just the day before when he was still awake and lucid, and I think we said what we needed to say to each other. He and I were very close, just as Granny and I were, and my last words to him were of love and gratitude. Being with Granny at the time of her death was a different experience. For one thing, it was in her home. Pap died in the hospital. When the men from the funeral home arrived later that night to take her away, I realized I was witnessing her leaving her house for the last time. When she was gone, even though we were still there, that house felt as empty as any place I've ever been. I had another realization that night that was almost as wrenching as knowing that Granny was gone, and that was realizing that this house, her house, might soon not belong to our family anymore. This house where my father had grown up, this house that had been a second home to me and my brother, the notion that it would not belong to us, that someone else would live here, it's just unfathomable to me. In many ways, I was closer to Pap and Granny than I was to my parents. For the last 15 years or so of her life, I unquestionably had a much closer relationship with Granny than I had or have with my mother. I moved out of my parents' house when I was about 20, lived in an apartment with a friend for a few years, then when that arrangement fell apart, moved back in with my parents. But when I moved back in with my parents, even though they and my brother all made every effort to make me feel at home, I never felt like I had really come back. You know, I felt like a guest, a welcome guest, but a guest. So I started spending weekends with Granny at her house. My brother and I often spent weekends with Pap and Granny when we were kids, so it just felt like a natural thing to me. When I was a child, I loved staying at Pap and Granny's so much that I used to have dreams where I would step through a portal that led from my room at home to the room where I slept at Pap and Granny's. Sometimes when I was very young, I would have this dream while I was already asleep at Pap and Granny's and wake up the next morning believing that the dream had been real, that I had somehow magically traveled to Pap and Granny's from my parents' house. Granny and I fell into a routine when I started spending weekends with her again as an adult. I'd arrive Friday evening, usually late. She'd either be up in the living room watching TV or in bed reading. I'd poke my head in and say hi. We'd chat for a few minutes. Then I'd go to my room, watch some TV, and go to sleep. The next day, I'd sleep in most of the morning, and Granny would make us lunch. The menu was always different, sometimes something simple like mac and cheese or a frozen pot pie she'd heat it up in the oven. Sometimes more complex, like green beans with potatoes and ham or roast beef and a baked sweet potato. The food was always good, but the best part of those meals was just sitting across the table from Granny and having a conversation with her. We could talk about anything. And we did. Family, what was happening in the news, sports, politics. When there was nothing else to talk about, Granny would update me on the latest goings-on in her neighborhood, which she always knew because she was friends with all of her neighbors, and her favorite spot in the house was in the living room, looking out her front window, watching what went on up and down her quiet street. I treasure those meals, those talks, those hours we spent together. Those times were just for me and Granny. She'd talk to me about my brother's latest girlfriend. She'd ask me about my love life, and if I had one at the time, I'd tell her. She'd ask if there were any good movies playing, and if there were, we'd plan on going to see them. I remember we saw Million Dollar Baby together, and she cried. Granny was sentimental, but... You had to get to know her in order to see it. She didn't come across as a softy initially. She was very plain spoken, very matter of fact. The first time my wife spoke to her after she'd been diagnosed with cancer several years ago and asked her if she was feeling any better, Granny responded, there's no cure for cancer, honey, so you might as well not get your hopes up. She was cynical about certain things and she was stubbornly independent and unmoving regarding her personal affairs. 
But when it came to other people, especially her family, she was the most selfless person I have ever known. She gave time, money, whatever was needed, whatever she could spare, never with any thought of something in return. In fact, if she gave you some money for something and you suggested paying her back, you'd get a dirty look to go along with that money. She just wouldn't hear of it. If you were one of her people and you needed something she had, it was yours. And that was that. She was also a worrier. My father joined the Navy after he graduated high school, and when he shipped out, Granny cried for a week. Or at least that's how she always told the story. She explained, it doesn't matter if they're 10 or 20 or 80 years old. If they're your baby, they're always your baby. She wasn't superstitious, generally speaking, had no particular use for horoscopes, often expressed suspicion, if not outright annoyance, at excessive displays of religious piety. But she never wished any specific ill on anyone, no matter how much she disliked them, for fear that some misfortune would actually befall them and she feel somehow responsible. Of course, she wasn't perfect. She wasn't a Trump supporter or anything. Trump was another source of worry for her and embarrassment. But she did watch Fox News and was a bit too credulous of what she saw there. She had an inherent mistrust of government and cynicism toward the political process, regardless of the people involved, that I just don't share. She told me once or twice about how, when she was a girl, the white children and the black children living in her small town would play together without taking much notice of what color everyone was. That experience made her far less overtly racist than many of her peers and disdainful of flagrant racism when she encountered it, but I think it also made her less able to recognize more subtle problems like institutionalized discrimination. And she spoke with pessimism and resignation about large-scale social problems, telling me often, that's just the way things are, sweetie. There's nothing you can do to change it. Despite all that, she was surprisingly tolerant and open-minded, especially compared to the stereotype of an old, middle-class, cis-hetero white woman. I can't honestly say I ever heard Granny say trans rights, but when same-sex marriage was being debated in our state legislature, Granny shared her opinion on the matter with me in her typical no-nonsense way. Live and let live, she said. And she's who brought up the subject. I didn't have to drag it out of her. I was proud that she said that, and a little relieved. Granny kept up with politics and social movements, but never seemed to engage with them on anything but a shallow level. Her worldview combined an unhappy but sincere conviction that humanity was in the long run doomed thanks to our own ignorance and incompetence with a naive but equally earnest belief that we could avoid that fate if we would all just try to get along together and treat each other better. She told me over and over again, from the time when I was first old enough to understand, be a lover, not a fighter. As I grew up, I slowly came to realize that the world was not that simple. We aren't presented with a clear-cut choice to love or to fight. Sometimes you have to do both. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do is fight. Fight injustice, fight intolerance, fight for those who need your help. And Granny knew this, of course. She grew up during the Great Depression. Her father was an alcoholic who died when she was 12 years old. Her brother suffered from rheumatic fever as a child and also died relatively young, as did her mother. Shortly after Granny married my pap, she contracted tuberculosis and spent most of the next year at a sanatorium. She knew life could be hard. She knew life didn't always present us with simple black and white choices. She told me, be a lover, not a fighter, because she didn't want to see me get hurt. It's the same reason she cried for my father when he joined the Navy. Her concern for our well-being took precedence over everything else. More than anything, she wanted us, the people she loved, to be all right. I wish everyone could have a person like that in their lives. I wish everyone could know what it feels like to have someone who loves you so much 
They don't care if the rest of the world goes to hell as long as you're okay. Because that kind of love changes you. That kind of love lets you know that you're worth something and that other people are worth something, and that the world and the people in it, as shitty as they can be sometimes, are worth fighting for. That's what my granny taught me, whether she realized it or not. Sometimes I'd stop in and see granny, and maybe it had been a while since I'd come to visit, and when I'd be about to leave, granny would give me this half-smile, half-smirk, and say, now don't you forget about your old granny. And I'd smile back and say, never. For 39 years, I had the best grandmother any grandchild could ever ask for. She was always there when I needed her. She never let me down. She was a friend I knew I could always trust no matter what. I'd like to think I was all those things for her, too. I hope I was. I hope she knew how much I loved her. The times we spent together, the lessons she taught me, the love she gave me every second of my life from the day I was born right up until 10 minutes before 5 p.m. January 9th, 2020, will be a part of me for the rest of my life. Those are things I'll never lose. And I'll never forget. Never.